Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Together, we'll explore and enjoy content and conversations around mastering transitions. In our relations, our wellness, our careers, our families, and especially in our missions and visions. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I have with me someone who's been a hero of mine for quite a number of years. I've had her book well in advance of this podcast, and I've gifted it, I think, three times. Octavia Rahim is the author of Gather. Oh my God, I'm getting emotional. And also <laughs> the upcoming book, Pause, Rest, Be. Mm. Stillness Practices for Courage During Times of Change. You can find her if you're listening to us right now. You can go to pauserestbe.com. It's a worthwhile visit. Octavia is a rest and yoga teacher. She has 16 years of experience, nearly 10,000 hours of leading yoga classes, immersions, trainings in various settings and online. I've just learned that we have been in each other's spheres for much longer than I thought. Yes. She is a Southern Black American woman centering her own well-being. I got my arms in the air. <laughs> yes. As an example to us all, but especially to women of color, it is a huge honor to have you here, Octavia. Welcome. It's such an honor to be here. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to read your bio, but I'm also going to sort of riff a little bit. Your work invites us into a quiet, contemplative place of inquiry, reflection, deeper self-love. You believe that rest is fuel. Yay. And you are on a mission to change the world, one well-rested person or organization at a time. And you do work with both individuals and organizations, which is notable because if you're listening to this, our listener, and you have a company or you know of a company or you work in a company where you think this work could accelerate potential in the company, please perk up your ears. <laughs> um, you're a mom. Yes. You're an online business owner. You used to be, <laughs> I love this part of your bio. She owned a brick and mortar yoga studio until August, 2020. You can probably guess what happened. <laughs> I love that. So when I, when I saw that, I was like, oh, this is my people. <laughs> I can probably guess what happened. I can definitely guess what happened. I did it in 2016. When did I close mm. that thing? 2016, 2014, I closed my studio and I was like, all right, there's something else. Mm -hmm. I just didn't know what it was yet. Mm. Um, you you were recently featured on the cover of Yoga Journal where all by myself in the co-op here in Santa Fe, my arms went up a second time. Mm. Woo! I that was so excited. Cover. <laughs> what? I was so excited when I saw that. I bought three copies. I sent them around. I was super stoked to mm. see. God, finally. Um, your book is coming out in February. And I'll say the title again. It's Pause, Rest, Be. I want to talk about the, the work that you do in organizations first. I don't know exactly why, but I want to make sure that we, we address that without forgetting it. Because I think it's important for folks who might be listening, who, like I said, own a company, work in a company, prioritizing this does, and it's been scientifically quantified, accelerate the potential of the workers and the organizations writ large. And I would love for you to talk about some of the work that you've done in companies. Yeah. So I love that introduction. I'm like, just keep talking. Mm, <laughs> I like, will. I, I want to listen. Um, and so I support people in resting at work is one kind of thread or avenue of my rest-based work that I do. And this really, you know, I've done it as long as I've been a yoga teacher on some level, but it was usually let's do stretches or let's do asana, like what people thought wellness and yoga had to look like in the workplace was, it looked really specific, I would say five or 10 years ago. Right. 
And as I've just kind of really claimed that what I do or undo (laughs) is rest, Mm -hmm. you know, I rest with people. And when people ask me to do things in the workplace, I go, well, I I can support you in resting and pausing and daydreaming and meditating and doing things that you don't have to change your clothes to do. But that really um, kind of accelerated last year in 2020, it accelerated And it pairs well with online. You know, I can do it in person, but I don't really do much in person right now. It can pair well online. And and essentially what people have been asking me to do is just help them pause in the middle of their workday. And what I tell companies and organizations is that Because in this country, and we're recording in the USA, in this country, we have such a really imbalanced relationship with work that to get people to interrupt or to start to shift their relationship with work, we actually, I feel like a place to start is work, right? You know, if you tell people, okay, meditate before you get to work or meditate after you get home, where most people are spending an exorbitant amount of time Mm. tasking and working. And, And also for me, it's just also really powerful to see organizations go, you know what, we are going to interrupt our regularly scheduled program Mm -hmm. to pause because part of what I posit with organizations or companies when I work with them is that your greatest solutions aren't going to come out of the place or the kind of vibration or energy or rhythm or cadence that you've been working at. Like if you were going to figure it out by doing more of the same, you would have already figured it out, you know? And so a lot of what I've been doing is we'll get on Zoom and we'll breathe and we'll meditate and we'll ponder what really needs to pause or rest within us. And then I'll guide people through really simple, deep relaxation. And then we start to daydream, right? Mm -hmm. And I usually do a few pre-calls with, with, you know, whoever's leading or whoever is supporting this, you know, me coming in to help people rest and daydream just to to gauge like what direction do you want me to support people in dreaming in? Mm -hmm. Because the thing is, Um, imagination and dreaming and daydreaming is something that, you know, artists, we are tapped into it. Writers, we are tapped into it. Creative folks, we are tapped into it. The greatest kind of inventions. And there's so much exists because someone followed a unusual thread or dreamed it up or imagined it and then went out and activated on it and did it. And the thing that I can't stop thinking about now is, well, if we don't have space and time to dream, imagine, and and just see what can emerge from the void, then again, we just keep doing more of the same, you know? And so that's what I've been doing a lot more of is supporting teams in resting and daydreaming. I worked with Lululemon's idea team, which is their inclusion, diversity, equity, and action team. And it was really fun and really insightful and so transformative for us all to, you know, and we weren't really reimagining anything specifically other than how we relate to work and how um, reimagining our relationship to work is an equity issue. It is Mm -hmm. a social justice issue. And most of the time what I do, it can't be done in one session. You can get a taste of it, right? Right. But it's like to reconfigure our relationships. We didn't get this way in a day or one session. So we won't, you know, rest our way out of this obsession with work in one session. So that is some of the I use the word work because it's the word people understand, but it's some of the rest, the way I'm resting in the world is resting with people and daydreaming with people and um, interrupting, you know, or disrupting Mm -hmm. um, in the most productive way, right? People's regularly scheduled program at work to to pause and rest and be. Yeah. You know, I find with myself, I have to actually schedule that time to daydream and I have to like spread out all my art stuff and Mm. just let go and have two to four hours just to mess around 
And yeah. then, and only then the ideas start to flow. Yeah. They, they need, um, I love that language of space to stretch out. Yeah. Like it's like your, your deeper visions, right? These greater ideas and solutions need space to stretch out. And the vision that came to mind was just someone being in a box and yeah. trying and trying to work around the box, figure out, <laughs> you know, like try to make the box work when really you just kind of you need to kick the the edges of the box, you need to expand. That's right. And I feel like um I don't feel like I know that rest and space is part of that expansion. And it's it's a practice, right? If you don't have a relationship with the pause or stillness, you have to build one, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and that building is bit by bit, moment by moment, you know, one session at a time. And what I find in um, resting at work, it is, it gives people this exquisite permission. Like it feels like this kind of accelerated, you know, cause I work with people around resting and making space for it and navigating through their own resistance around it individually. And I find when I work with people in groups, it's pretty profound because they can look around and go, oh, this is a, this is an accepting container. I can finally say I'm tired and I need to rest. And there are other people here saying I'm tired and I need to rest or let me at least see what this is about. Um, So I think it can be really powerful to do to undo or to rest in in a collective space together and with the people you work with. Yeah. I also find with most of my friends of color and even some of my friends who are white or white passing, we've been conditioned to see ourselves as little worker bees. And that's the only time when we have value Mm. meaning and it's profound it's so old it's so Mm. outdated and for you as a woman of color to be that example to other women of color I really can't thank you enough for my friends of color who you know really look up to you yeah and uh and need you yeah you know like so it's deep it is so deep as a as a black woman I think and I feel this in my bones what you know, so part of my lineage or a group of my ancestors and, you know, what does it mean to be from a group of people who were forced free labor in on a land or in a space? Mm-hmm. And the impact of coming from people who to rest might have meant to die, right? And so these sayings like I'll rest you know, I'll rest when I die or I'll sleep when I'm dead or my mother used to say that. Yeah. So many people, you know, and so I think there's this kind of American cultural thread, you know, rooted in intense capitalism. And I also, for all of us, for all of us. And then I think we start to drill it down to being black or a person of color in this country or being a woman women's labor is completely devalued and and not named and not acknowledged and then when you are having these very lived experiences are you have it in your lineage where to pause or to claim the worth of your work or to say I need rest was maybe to meet your death, you know, or some consequence against your body, what, what does that mean then to rest? And so like, I don't take for granted what all there is to navigate through mentally, physically, emotionally, and culturally with people when we, when I start to extend this invitation to rest, some people are skeptical, (laughs) you know, some people have emailed me and been like, you are out of your mind. It's not safe for me to rest you know, how am I going to do that? Or also if you come from a family or a background where to rest meant that something wasn't going to get done because there was no one else who was going to do it. (laughs) There's no one to pick up the slack, right? And so I think on this one level, I'm talking about rest and it's also like a reclamation of our humanity, Mm -hmm. right? I am not I'm not a mule. One of my favorite um, writers, Zora Neale Hurston, 
um, had this line where she said, it looks like, you know, the Black woman's the mule of the world. Like you keep, you're being worked and worked and tall and tall until your back is broken. And then that's it, you know? And, and I think about that so, so much is how to unburden myself and how to unmule myself. And there's, it's, it's not, I don't take it for granted. I don't think it's easy. I'm not just saying simply go rest. <laughs> Right. You know, I'm not, I'm, you know, people go, but I can't, I don't, I don't go. Yes, you can. I'm like, there's a lot, there's a lot in the way that we can see and that we cannot see, yeah. you know, um, it takes a lot to trust that mm-hmm. we can slow down and we can rest, you know, and there are consequences when we do. And there are also consequences when we don't though. Major, mm-hmm. much worse, actually. Yeah. That's right. At least right now. In, yeah, right um, now. Yeah. In Gather, I'm going to skip past and then go back to the introduction because that's where I knew we were going to be friends. Um, <laughs> the four years old in love yeah. with reading. Yes. I'm just going to say it now. I was four years old. This is the introduction to Gather. And then we're going to get into pause recipe, I promise. I was four years old and in love with reading when I realized the words on a page those small curved black bodied things were scribbled together and created by someone. It was then that you decided Octavia, that you'd be someone who writes. I can't even that. I actually had the same, such a similar experience as a little tiny girl where Mm -hmm. my, from, I don't know, one and a half or two on, there was a big shift in my home and I remember that my books were my life. Yes. I did not go anywhere without them. They were right Mm -hmm. next to me when I was eating. They were right next to me when I was in the car. They Mm -hmm. were next to me in my bed. And I knew at some point that I was going to be somebody who put words together like that and put them in a book. Mm -hmm. Just like you. But, But here's the point. The mules part, which is what I wanted to focus on on page 32 of gather. I have a note about it. As I heal, I transform my lineage and my legacy. This is what you, what Tracy Stanley is doing. There's so many other teachers who are doing this. Um, You're doing it to such a great effect for so many of us. So many of my uh, white friends are, you know, Hands to the floor, hands on your feet, Octavia, like thanking you for your work, for for making rest the conversation, the only conversation, not just an adjunct to the conversation. Mm -hmm. But as you heal, as I heal, but as you heal, you're transforming that story about Mm -hmm. Black women in this way. And I, I, I feel like it's it's probably the most important conversation we're having because if we could do this. Mm. I'm not kidding. And I know all the serious shit that's going on right now. Mm. It's it's December, almost December 2021. Mm -hmm. If we can transform the way that the world looks at women of color, Black women in particular, a lot can change. Mm. I Mm. feel I've always known this. Mm. And that's that's the healing that I'm here for. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and it is, you know, taking place within me. It has to take place yeah. within within you and within all of us. And and so when I talk about rest, I'm I'm talking about laying down, getting snuggy, all of that. I'm also really talking about the pause or as Tracy Stanley talks about. Um, your relationship with the transition, right? The space in between. And when I'm talking about rest, I'm talking about the pause, that place where there is quite a bit of uncertainty, many unknowns. Mm -hmm. There's also an immense amount of possibility within that place. When it's an unknown, there's possibility as well. And, And I'm really talking about what's our relationship with that really uncomfortable place. And when I think about, you know, transformation on the level that is needed for 
us all and for the humanization of those who've been really marginalized, our discomfort with the pause is our discomfort with the other, <laughs> you know? Right. And, and so I, what I know about rest is like, when I pause, when I am still, when I pay attention, when I stay awake to the transition, as Tracy Stanley says, right. there's so there, I can see myself more clearly. And as I can see myself more clearly, I can see you more clearly. I can see the next person more clearly. And so for, for all of us, I think relationship with the pause or rest to me is really about coming into a relationship with more within more clarity within ourselves. And that's what's going to support us in more um, be, being more transparent, also seeing others as they truly are, not as we have learned them to be not as history has told us they are, you know, not, you know, like just see who's actually in front of you and see yourself, you know, like as you actually are the, the fullness of it, the, the shadow and the light. And so for me is the pause is a place to gather this, this um, insight. And then we don't stop there. Then we can actually move forward. <laughs> you know, it's like, we're not just, resting and that's it that's all there is to do it's just like rest gets us real it gets us ready you know um mm. it I say it's fuel because most of the time we are so conditioned we run off fumes and you you know what it feels like when you're in your car and you see that e-light come on and <laughs> pressing it a little bit more do you you know that level of kind of fear and anxiety that come like so I think we are not a car we are not a machine yet no. we treat ourselves sometimes worse we like here's the e-light on and we're like I'm gonna push it hundreds more hours but what we're doing within our nervous system is like now the light is blinking it's blinking it's blinking mm -hmm. and we're in a profound state of fight, flight, fear, you know. There's no um, cortisol left. Yes. <laughs> you know, running Don't. off literal fumes. Yeah. And that also impacts how we meet where we arrive at, you know. <laughs> so you get there and now you're tired as hell. You're mm -hmm. completely out of it. Your vision is blurry and you encounter another human. You literally crash into them. Mm -hmm. um, so... And so I, I do believe that, um, so when I, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. So I got married 15 years ago this year <laughs> and on our um, invitation, we had this line and I don't remember where it came from, but we said, join us as we join hands with the past, present and future. And and I think on some level, if we want to get really deep, we're constantly interacting with, you know, the past, present and future. And, and so for me, when I'm in this moment and I drop into rest, you know, if we go to the practices like yoga nidra, I feel like in that practice, I can traverse space and time. I have access to wisdom that I don't have access to just in my waking state and and essentially rest is also or the pause is a place where it's a deeply present place. But I posted this quote yesterday by um, the founder of Kashi. And I believe what it says is when we are present, <clears throat> we are in eternity, you know, and my healing in this presence, I believe and know and feel in my body, it supports and impacts what will be after me and what came before before me mm -hmm. you know because my healings also I'm like I'm in relationship with my ancestors as I do this yeah. um, and I do it in their memory I do it in the memory of my maternal grandmother who you know cleaned houses and wasn't invited to eat her meals at the table but the dog was she sat outside back of the kitchen you know like I'm like I do this work in memory of that woman and in memory of her mother Rose and in memory of her mother whose name I do not know mm -hmm. you know um and so a lot of times when I start a rest circle I invite people to consider who within their lineage they are inviting to rest with them 
Like, mm. cause we all have someone who they never rested. <laughs> they never paused. They never, um, or they rarely got to come full face to face with the depth, the depth of their own humanity that rest can bring us into. And so it's one of my favorite ways to start a rest practice is to say, okay, now we're in this room, <laughs> we're pausing the Zoom room usually nowadays. Mm. Who do you invite into this rest space with you? Right, right. Can we study with you? Can we take classes with you like this? You know, Zoom? you know, right now my books are like my biggest, yes, <laughs> you know, like may they reach tens of thousands, right? And so I work with people, I rest with people at work. I have an online um, studio, Star Shine and Clay for Black women and women of color. And I have two teachers within it and I have guest teachers. I don't usually teach within it that much anymore. Mm -hmm. And I have a program called Devoted to Rest that I lead once a year for 20 to 24 Black women in education, leadership, and business who want to um, deepen their relationship to rest and, and, and transform their relationship to really work through rest. And then my hope is that when I work with these 20 women who have great impact in their companies, organizations, and the world, that it, you know, it trickles out into those places where they're reaching now hundreds of people, mm -hmm. you know, so Instead of me being like, I have to be the one to lead the exact thing for a thousand people. <laughs> I'm just right. like, how do I really touch people who are doing things in the world where they, they reach the volume and they have a really intimate and transformative experience with me that then they, it changes how they work and how they rest and how they lead and how they guide and how they navigate the world. So that's what I'm doing. And every so often, <laughs> I um, I lead kind of more open classes. And for okay. those who purchase four more copies of Paul's Rest B, I'm going to be leading a half-day online retreat in February 2022. But all of that's at my website. And so that session will be more of what I'm talking about. We'll, we'll be resting and we'll be daydreaming. And we might have an opportunity to consider who in our lineage we want to be in rest relationship with as we lay down well guess who's going to be buying four more copies of pause rest B. <laughs> i want to take us over to page 58 in this book <clears throat> in pause rest B. <laughs> yes please page 58 um you are not lost you are here to reorient your way to the path that is truly yours to walk yeah. <laughs> All I know is I need to hear that at least once a day. Mm. And that one, I'm with your permission, I'm going to make a little piece of art that I can post on Instagram. That'll be our next, Ooh, my next I post. Love that. Is that okay? It, it'll be yeah. very plain, like nothing too, you know, flashy or anything, but it is, it absolutely needs to be shared. And I'm going to do that with several of these pages because each page to our listener, hi, each page is a journey in itself, is a reminder, is a reaffirmation, a reconnection, a recollection. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's just, my arms are up again here in my closet. It's everything, this book. It's everything. There is no, I don't need another book for 2022. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go to one more. This is a really good one. It's the, actually the next page, 59. How many titles have you claimed? How many distinctions have you been given? How much of it felt unreal and false? Like you were wearing a suit that impressed everybody, but, but barely fit you. You are allowed to change as many times as you need to to become your authentic self. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then just in case you didn't get it, forget your name and what they call you. Page 60. You came here to remember your heart and soul. 
how I think there's at least one listener who's going to want to know this. Where and when did this come to you? Were you traveling? Were you home? Were you sitting? Were you just meeting the muse early in the morning? Tell us how you wrote this book. <laughs> uh, we probably all remember um, June 2020. We do. And last summer, I kind of just really unplugged. Like I had this moment where I felt like I was burning up with fire. And, you know, fire can destroy, transform, purify. It was doing all the things to me. Mm -hmm. And um, I would, I started going on, I stopped being on the internet so much. And I started just going on these long walks and basically talking to myself out loud. (laughs) My girl, Um, (laughs) that's that's how we do it. (laughs) And, and just. It came to me on a walk, like, I want to write a book about endings. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, so much is ending right now. Then I thought, yeah, but so much is beginning right now. And then I thought, and so much is in that murky place where it's like, I know I can't go back. There's no turning around. Mm -hmm. And I have no full idea of what is next is that liminal space or that place in between the liminal, right? Like part of the Latin root of it means the threshold, right? I love that word. And and so ultimately I was like, well, I'm going to write a book about that. (laughs) And I actually started writing with endings and the parts you read from are from the middle section of the book, which is the the part that is the in-between, the space in-between. And And that part, I, you know, so I was going on my walks and talking to myself for most of the book, but that particular part, I literally sat in a room and I felt like someone would whisper, Um, an ancestor, right? A guide would go, you are not lost, you know? And I just write it like for some, and so a lot of um, the liminal part of this book, I'd literally rest, lay down practice yoga nidra restorative yoga and then sit and just wait to hear whatever I heard Mm. and it feels like that write it with obedience you know (laughs) and um and so the liminal or the middle part of the book is just really short phrases that can be read alone but the whole section reads as a whole thing as well like they're vignettes and it's also a complete part on its own but it really was just resting and listening and trusting that what I heard was mine to say yeah yeah and mine to share all I know is this is a a game-changing book that needs to be in as many hands as possible and ideally I'm not kidding, should be in schools. Oh, that would be amazing. (laughs) This this middle section is awesome. The end is yoga. The end is more yoga instruction and part three is more yoga instruction. And uh, really beautifully said, like, I wish I had the book in my hand because I want to bring it with me into a retreat, my first retreat in two years, but I'll bring my computer and hopefully the students will understand. it's so important to to get this into the hands of the children. Mm. I feel. Mm-hmm. And I think it's worthwhile to think about what teachers we know. I'm happy to get on this. What teachers do we know? And how can we start to bring even just some of the middle sections? I mean, page 81 on the wall of a classroom. 81 81 Uh listen it's time now spread your wings and take off to the sky after all of this nothing can harm you now you know your song (sighs) makes me cry when i read this one you know your song rise up singing rise (sighs) the one where you're where you're a seed yeah i forget what i forget what um and don't lock yourself out of your own heart. Yeah. Gosh. I want to find the seed one because I, I think I want to post that one too. 
It's so beautiful. I'm just scrolling. Oh, here it is. There is no way to apply existing logic here. Yes. There's no there's no sense or meaning to me. There's no normal to idealize and place on a pedestal. There's only the ground you are sitting on, and even that feels like it is crumbling. That's right. Sink into the ground. You are a seed. Oh, I can't. You're, you're, there's something so... The force is strong with you, woman. <laughs> So strong. Mm. <sighs> Pardon my Star Wars speak. Um, well, you know, I, I, I'm i reading the audio book. I read the audio book for my book. Yes, thank God. <laughs> I was really, really happy to be able to do that, though. It was it was it was challenging to read aloud because it's like you see what happens to you when you read it. So I'm having the same experience. And so I'm in this little tiny studio reading my book, reading my book. And I just start to have this feeling of it being really crowded in the room. Yes. And I said, oh, my ancestors are with me. They're here. They're yeah. here, you know. Yeah. And also my dedication in this book is, is really to us all, for everyone who survived the last few years and everyone who didn't, who mm. did not, you know, and mm when I read this book, when I hold this book, when I hear people read it, I hear both the weight and light, the, the weight and lightness of the time we're living through and in. Yes. You know, and I feel the weight and lightness of who is still here and who is not here. And I really do hope and I pray, right? You know, so that was also part of my ritual. Like I pray prayers that don't have words, right? Some prayers mm -hmm. are words. And but I guess if there were wrote words, you know, my opening prayers I would work on this book was let me be a clear vessel and an instrument and and let this this book be healing, mm -hmm. you know, to to people who might who never would think like, I'm going to read a book like that. You know, I'm like, I want to reach the people who are listening to you, you know, and I want to reach the people who maybe thought about resting yoga. And I also want to reach people who are hurting and confused are facing new beginnings or struggling with an ending or in that murky place in between who aren't necessarily, they wouldn't say I'm a yogi. Right. And so my prayer and hope is, for the seed to drop down and the roots to go deep and then spread all around and just burst from the ground. And that seed being Paul's recipe, this book. Um, and so I channeled it, I wrote it. <laughs> I lived many of the experiences within it and am living through this liminal space very much myself. And what I also know is this book is coming forward and it now belongs to all of us. Yeah. 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 I'm actually really glad you did the audible because very oftentimes they don't have the actual author do it. And I think that's like the biggest mistake. I have an incredible editor at Shambhala. Like she is. Of course, um, Shambhala. <laughs> of course. You know, Beth yes. Frankel at Shambhala is really. God bless. Um, yeah, she's a very special woman. And I just always imagine her really speaking for me in rooms that I'm not in. And I'm like, you all, you need people like that in your corner who they're, they are going to speak and advocate for you, the best of you, even when you're not there. So I'm grateful for that. Shout out to Beth. <laughs> Shout out to Beth. <laughs> Thank God. You know, and what Tracy, Tracy Stanley, I just the talked best. to her the other day. I just recorded some things for her and she was just like, you know, for, for these kinds of books, there's a transmission. We need to hear your voice. We yeah. need to hear your voice. And I had a director when I was recording and he's an amazing voice actor. He wasn't in the studio. He was in the headphones in my ear and he was giving me great direction. And sometimes I would go, you know what? Flynn, I think maybe you should just read this book. He says, no. He's like, I might be an award-winning voice actor. I am not you. He's like, I am not you. I am not your voice, <laughs> right? And I really appreciated that because he said, 
you bring something to this project that it is it's beyond skill, right? You know, he's like, I know techniques, but you know, you know, like the soul of this work. And so that's right. I appreciated that affirmation. And frankly, we needed the uh, all the people in the room with you in that yes, place, too. Right. <laughs> it wouldn't of be the course. same. We need those people, obviously. <laughs> And they might have not shown up for another voice. Right? So. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So. Exactly. <clears throat> so last question. Yes. Your own practices, are they in any particular direction? Is there Buddhism, which I sense is somewhere in your space because of the way that you speak about the present moment and the sinking into the crumbling ground? Well, you know what? I grew up very um, in a very like Southern Christian, my home church that I grew up in is called Greater Timber Ridge Baptist Church. And I am very interested in the path of Christ, like who Christ actually was, not who we are, you know, how, how it plays out most of the time through organized religion. You know, I study mindfulness and meditation. I've read like all the books <laughs> on Buddhism. And I also, you know, honor traditional African religion. Yeah. And, you know, I meditate a lot on the light of Christ, you know, to say it plain. And then my personal yeah. kind of yoga practices are yoga nidra, mm -hmm. which keeps me in communion with the mother, restorative yoga. And I also practice a lot of um, yin yoga. And so those are my, those are my things that I bring together. You know, like I come from a family of just deep abiding faith and somewhat religious, but also those in my family who kind of break out of the dogma of religion. My mother was very much one who she'd be like, I'm seeking the heart of Christ. I want to know the heart of Christ. And that caused her version of Christianity to look very different from most people's. And I would say I swim in that ocean with her <laughs> in that same ocean. You know, it's wild. The um... Baptist Church gospel singing has always had my heart. Anytime I'm visiting another town, yeah. when I was traveling a lot as a kid, uh, as a as a in my twenties as a kid, twenties and thirties, <laughs> traveling a lot. It's so funny, um, like twenties as kid now. <laughs> that was kid. Didn't know it at the time. Now I know. Right, you couldn't have said that then. Yeah. No, I was an adult. Um, I would always on Sunday, if I was in another town, didn't matter where, what country, I would go and find the Baptist church and sit in the back. Oh, yeah. You know, one of my greatest um, a ritual that happened every Sunday at my church was altar call, mm -hmm. where the preacher would get up and there'd be praying. And again, it was this great moment of pause. It was a long pause between the preacher standing up and calling forward those who needed to come to the altar for prayer or wanted to be witnessed bowing to pray at the altar. And as a little girl, I just sat in the back of the church and was mesmerized by this moment because it was essentially a call to stand up and say, I need support. I need prayer. I need love. I need community. Because, you know, at my church, you had to stand up, walk out into the aisle, and then people would meet you and walk you up to the altar and bow down with you. <sighs> and, and that visual, right? you wow. know, like, and in my world, I didn't see adults say, it's me. I need need you to walk me down the aisle, aisle and I need you to bow and pray with me. And so I just sit there mesmerized by this display of, you know, vulnerability and humanity and um, truth that would happen. And, and um, you know, then whoever went forward would go forward. They'd be prayed over. Usually they might fall out and get covered up with a white sheet. And it was this, it has stuck with me. And 
And for me now, many of my rest practices, I have that same feeling of inside those practices being called to the altar, the altars within my heart, though, you know, and and that's the spirit out of which I teach, you know, I I find great connections in my yoga practices and the spirituality that I encountered um, as a little girl in Gainesville, Georgia at Greater Timber Ridge Baptist Church, you know. So that's that's who I am. I'm I'm yeah. all of those things and I don't exclude any of them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, all of it. And I don't feel like any of them are at odds, though I'm sure someone <laughs> would disagree with me. <laughs> You know what? The people who disagree with you will have to take that up with their maker. Right. That's right. That's all. <laughs> the truth is we are all of these things. I, I too, I t- completely understand and look to the light of Christ. <laughs> like who, who wouldn't? <laughs> you stupid if you don't. <laughs> like it's right there for you. He's there. <laughs> that energy it's i i see it as an energy rather yeah. than like a mm-hmm. being but it's an energy like that is there. spirit yeah 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 so all of the things you know what i was just watching totally tangential and not the um the film one of the most classic films the passion of joan of arc mm. if you haven't seen it it's worth seeing it's uh it's in the silent film era it was made in the late 20s I think it's one of the most important films I've ever seen. And if you want to talk about the light of Christ, you will see the light of Christ in that actor's eyes. Renee Maria Falconetti, rest in peace. Mm. What a performance. You will mm. never, you've never seen anything like it before since. Mm. Yeah, it's worth yeah, checking I out. I haven't seen that one. Mm-hmm. And when you then look up like, okay, what would what did Joan of Arc do? It's like, holy shit. Yeah. There's a badass. We could use a Joan of Arc right around now. <laughs> right around now. Mm. I just want to thank you so much, friend. So much for being here. What a joy. I could just talk to you all day. You are a light to so mm. many of us. I hope you feel that. Mm. And and at the same time, we also do not want you to feel like you have to keep going. You also get to rest. And you are still, you know, the, the wise thing that you've done is you've, you've put your work on paper. Mm-hmm. I can't wait to hold it in my hands. Mm-hmm. And your work continues while you rest. That's right. Your work <laughs> continues. And that is uh, the ultimate example. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for being here and just sending you all of my respect and love. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.